right, this is screencast number two on Ozymandias by um, Percy by Shelley. Um, so I was talking about the, the fact that it's structured like a Petrarchian sonnet, but the rhyme scheme is slightly off. Um, in, a re in, an original, uh, in the original form of a Petrarchian sonnet, you have an eight line octave that has the rhyme scheme of ABBA, 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 ABBA. Um, and then the sestet has a CDE or CDE kind of uh, rhyme scheme. Um, so he's kind of defying that traditional form, which, I mean, that's kind of the whole idea of romantic period writing anyway, right? Um, but it does make this very memorable that it's a deviation from that. So there's kind of like an extended metaphor throughout this entire poem. So all around this traveler is the desert. Nothing is green. Nothing is growing. The land is very barren. Um, the statue, however, boasts of the accomplishments that this civilization had in the past. So it says, my name is Ozymandias on the pedestal. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. So at one point in time, there was a very flourishing um, kind of society there, culture there at one point in time. And so... The, the point, I think, is, is that nothing powerful and nothing rich is ever going to stay that strong forever. Um, the, the staying power of uh, our impermanence, really, of power and fate, um, no matter what you, um, you think that you have created or, or what um, you think you have, like it's nothing, nothing is going to last. Um, and so I think that that idea there is that, you know, um, that nothing, nothing, everything that's so powerful, this, this man who thought he was the king of kings, this all powerful man, uh, eventually fell into ruin. It reads more like a story than a, po a poem. Um, although, you know, those rhymes at the end of the lines help us remind us that it is definitely not prose. Um, he's talking in first person. So I, I met a traveler. Um, and so, um, we don't really know where, uh, the speaker met this sojourner. And we also don't know where the traveler has visited prior. Um, we do kind of get the hint that, um, that this is uh, Egypt um, with the whole idea. So the Greeks called Ramses the second, who was a powerful Egyptian pharaoh. They called him Ozymandias. So this antique land uh, here seems to be Egypt, which is one of the oldest civilizations in the world. So, and then the rest of the poem after that first line is really... Um, Dialogue. So the traveler is recounting his experiences in Egypt to the poet speaker persona. Okay. Um, lines two through 14 are one sentence in length together, uh, if you'll notice. Like it's one long sentence. Um, and they contain um, some of the most vivid and most beautiful imagery in all of poetry. Um, in lines two through four, He's talking about the statue um, through the eyes of this traveler. We see these two massive legs carved from stone that are in the, they stand in the desert. So we have the two legs that are standing up. There's no trunk. There's no body attached to it. Just the legs, the stone legs are standing up. And then nearby on the sand, the visage or the face is half buried. It's broken. Um, but on that visage, on that face, you can still see the, the frown and the sneer, um, which he says that, who, that whoever had sculpted it um, well knew that, that face to be able to um, stamp it on that lifeless thing. Um, this ruler probably had absolute power. He probably definitely ruled with an iron fist. Probably thought very highly of himself. Um and, uh, you know, a lot of pride, a lot of, um, 
uh, arrogance about his command. Um, and so um, this guy, uh, this Ozymandias, um, is has is commanded for this statue to be erected. Um, because on the statue below, the pedestal below, we see his engraving on there. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, um, there. Um, so I want to talk about that for just a second. So this also is very telling of Ozymandias' personality. Um, he is ordering all of those who look on him, upon him, uh, to look upon everything that he has created, um, be afraid of it, um, despair about it. Uh, so we have a little bit of his hubris here. Like he, he's definitely full of himself and thinks that he is all powerful and all creating. Uh, so the last three lines here, nothing beside remains around the decay of that colossal wreck, balance and bare, the lone and level sand stretched far away. Um, we're really powerful uh, here in this kind of changing of the tone. He's gone. Ozymandias is gone. And so is his empire. Nothing beside remains except for the broken, shattered pieces of this statue that he had erected to, you know, celebrate himself. Um, the civilization is, you know, it has fallen. And it's turned to dust, much like the pieces of the statue that are all that are left behind. So, it's almost like in a mockery of the ruler of Ozymandias. You know, he's, he's this once all-powerful, almighty pharaoh has become powerless uh, and lies in a state of decay and wreck. And, you know, it's laying in the middle of a desert. Uh, there's nothing left there. Um, he's fallen. And so all leaders are going to eventually pass. All great civilizations will eventually turn into dust. You know, the, the, the kind of a commentary on the, the power of time and the elements and nature and, you know, what you once thought was this glorious thing has now become nothing. Nothing beside remains.